HIV AIDS is still considered a global epidemic by the World Health Organization. Around 60% of new infections occur in sub-Saharan Africa. In the UK and America, we view it as a distant crisis, but many of the epidemiologists, activists, and members of the gay community will never forget the peak of the epidemic. All of us who lived through that period have, and who were close in, to some extent, have had to work our way through some level of post-traumatic stress disorder. You'd go to a nightclub and expect to see friends you'd seen there for years. They wouldn't be there. They were in hospital and then they were dead. The whole of the 1980s, for me, was just a succession of funerals for people my own age. Thanks to new drugs, people with HIV in this country usually now live normal and long lives. But in the 1980s and 90s, that was unimaginable. At that point in time, I thought I might have about eight years left to live. Um, and so the, the, your, your world just comes back to you uh, in sort of flashes. Um, and you just had to start to think about what you were going to do uh, in order to um, make the most out of what you had left. Dame Anne Johnson is an epidemiologist whose work has contributed to safe sex and HIV prevention. She reflected on the early years of the crisis. So HIV was an epidemic which emerged in the 1980s. It was first identified as a cluster of cases of gay men in, in the United States who had a, a peculiar immunodeficiency syndrome. Nobody understood what the cause of it was. What subsequently we came to recognise, and this is not dissimilar to, in, in a sense, all epidemics, was that the virus has actually entered human populations probably some decades earlier, going back to old specimens, and probably emerged from a pr primates in the, in the uh, sub-Saharan uh, situation. And it was only able to spread, as with all infections, viruses will spread in environments where human behaviours and, if you like, the biological characteristics of infections collide, and they can then spread in populations. And we, and we see that in almost all big epidemics. 3% of men who had sex with men had been infected in, uh, in uh, 1982. And two years later, just two years later, that fraction had risen to more like 20%. So we had this huge outbreak on our hands. And at the time that I started, there was it just like we've had actually in this COVID epidemic, there were all sorts of things that people said were definite, which turned out not to be definite in the long run. We thought that it was only transmitted in, in among men who have sex with men and it gradually became evident that it was also heterosexually transmitted and that actually the main epidemic as has emerged is a heterosexually transmitted epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. There were great hopes for a vaccine and I have old cuttings from those days saying you know vaccine will be available within five years and of course here we are more than 35 years on and we still don't have a vaccine. People were very frightened about it and it was also addressing an area of people's lives that were just not discussed, and that was sexual behaviour. Very early on, LGBT activists became deeply involved in the crisis and campaigned for quicker government action. Lisa Power is an activist who founded Stonewall in the UK and went on to be the first openly LGBT person to speak at the UN. In the 1980s, she was a volunteer at Gay Switchboard an information support helpline for LGBT people. Gay Switchboard, as it still was then, became one of the two key places that people could get information hot off the press, not just even hot off the press. We were getting stuff before the gay press were getting it. But before AIDS, we used to get calls on the line from people who were terrified that they had syphilis or gonorrhea. And it was a mental health thing that they, they felt so guilty about the sexual acts that they had participated in that they couldn't believe they didn't have a sexually transmitted infection. And we started to get that with AIDS, people who could not possibly have got it, who would make up these fantastic um, scenarios in which um, they might have put their handle, uh, they, they might have put their hand on a door handle that might have been touched by a gay man who might have been masturbating. And it's like, what? Do you really think about this as you go around town? <laughs> Um, but then there were the real calls as well, the calls from people who just had a diagnosis. And in those days, a diagnosis was a death sentence. You expected to have one to two years because it was quite late being diagnosed for a lot of people then. Um, people who were losing their friends, people who 
were having to tell their families that they had AIDS and that was their way of coming out as gay as well, uh, which was really hard. And I think some of the most heartbreaking of all were from uh, gay men who had their partners had died with AIDS and they had not been allowed near them in the hospital because nobody recognized gay relationships. And some had been barred from the funeral. Um, they'd been thrown out of their homes because the family of their partner would descend and take over. Um, those were really horrific. And I think that's really what led to a lot of people starting to think harder about strength, strengthening the legislation which enabled the recognition of uh, lesbian and gay relationships. All of us who lived through that period have, and who were close in, to some extent, have had to work our way through some level of post-traumatic stress disorder. Because when you have deaths just coming at you, and, and not just deaths, but other people who've had deaths happen to them who were then traumatised, um, there were a lot of people acting out about stuff because they were in such grief and distress themselves. It, that was quite a thing to go through. And I think a lot of people, particularly people who are long term survivors, who are still living with HIV now, who have lived when they didn't expect to, who've lived beyond the lifespan of most of their friends. That's really hard. And it's not exaggerating hugely to say that some of those people are in a very similar mental state to people who survived death camps at various times, who've survived massacres of various kinds. You feel guilty. You feel weird. Why did I survive? Um, and I think now that we can treat HIV, now that we can make it non-transmissible, now that we can test people in the blink of an eye almost, it's easy for us to forget what a lot of the older people in the community went through in the 80s and the 90s. Human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell also talks about the trauma he experienced as a result of the crisis. The early days of the HIV AIDS pandemic felt like living through a war. All around me, young people my own age, in their 20s or early 30s, were dropping dead. You'd go to a nightclub and expect to see friends you'd seen there for years. They wouldn't be there. They were in hospital and then they were dead. The whole of the 1980s, for me, was just a succession of funerals for people my own age. It was emotionally profoundly shocking. And even to this day, I, I don't think I've ever fully recovered from it. The trauma of what our generation of gay and bisexual men went through cannot be underestimated and can never be understood by someone who did not go through it. Thankfully, somebody who is HIV positive in this country now is likely to live a very normal life. Ian Green is the CEO of Terence Higgins Trust, the UK's leading HIV AIDS charity. I've been living with HIV for almost 25 years now. I take three tablets a day. Um, I don't have any side effects uh, from that. Um, and the, the medication is so effective, it does suppress the amount of virus uh, in your blood uh, to an undetectable level. I started to feel uh, unwell whilst on a work trip to um, the Middle East, and I came back early, I was so feeling so unwell. Um, and over a sort of a two or three month period, my GP tested me for lots of different things, and in the end said, well, why don't we do another HIV test? Um, and I remember it was in uh, July uh, of 1996, when I went to his consulting room and uh, he told me that I've been diagnosed as HIV positive. And it was like having a rug pulled from under your feet. Um, at that point in time, I thought I might have about eight years left to live. Um, and so the, the, your, your world just comes back to you uh, in sort of flashes. Um, and you just had to start to think about what you were going to do uh, in order to um, make the most out of what you had left and uh, I was, had an amazing uh, group of friends and my family were incredibly supportive um, but here I am today 26 years later um, and because of that effective treatment um, I now know that I can have a normal life expectancy which is incredible. Unfortunately large parts of the world cannot access treatment and there are still an average of 1 million deaths a year from AIDS but immense progress has been made and that is in large part due to the commitment of the LGBT community, many of whom are no longer with us.